This hearing of the Subcommittee on Commodity Exchanges, Energy, and Credit entitled Examining Opportunities for Growth and Investment in Rural America will come to order. Welcome and thank you all uh, for joining today's hearing. Uh, after brief opening remarks, uh, members will receive testimony from our witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. Uh, members will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. When you are recognized, you will be asked to unmute your microphone, and we'll have five minutes to ask your questions or make a comment. If you are not speaking, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize background noise. In order to get to as many questions as possible, the timer will stay consistently visible on your screen. And with that, welcome uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, appreciate you all being here uh, to this first hearing of the Subcommittee on Commodity Exchanges, Energy, and Credit for the 117th Congress. I would also like to welcome the members of this subcommittee as my first hearing as chairman in what I aim to be a productive and bipartisan tenure. Today's hearing will examine a topic many of us know intimately, the critical need and importance of investment in rural America. USDA analyses tell us that between 2010 and 2018, Population growth in rural America has lagged behind the growth in our urban areas. Additionally, job growth in rural communities increased at just half of the rate it did in urban areas. I could go on with facts and figures about how many schools, hospitals, grocery stores, small businesses, and farms have closed in our rural communities in the last decade. But if you live in a rural community like I do, you already know that. This hearing is also not just about the typical economic drivers in rural communities, but about the infrastructure that's needed to serve those communities and support the critical role they play in the agricultural production and manufacturing industries. Our nation's aging infrastructure problem is exacerbated in rural communities. Inadequate access to high-speed internet impacts every level of a community from students being able to do homework, farmers and ranchers utilizing precision agricultural technologies and their operations all the way to how quickly a grocery store can process a transaction at their checkout. Our goal cannot just be to keep rural communities alive. We need to do the work to ensure that those communities are thriving and can succeed in a 21st century economy. And that's what I hope to get out of this hearing today. Our witnesses are working every single day to build thriving rural communities, including a witness from my own district in upstate New York. Their testimony today will help inform us on how we can strengthen rural development in the next Farm Bill and how we work with our partners at the USDA Rural Development as they continue to implement the 2018 Farm Bill. The daily lives and well-being of over 46 million people in rural counties across America are directly impacted by the kind of work we'll do here today. And I want to ensure that every single one of those 46 million people can choose to stay in their rural communities for years and decades to come. I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member, the gentlewoman from Minnesota, Mrs. Fishbach, for any opening remarks she would like to give. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and hello to my colleagues here in the room and on the Zoom, um, and welcome to all of our witnesses. Um, it really is nice to be here for the first meeting of our subcommittee. Um, like many of you, I represent a rural district. We are among the top ag-producing districts in the nation, and we are responsible for nearly half of Minnesota's agricultural sales. My district plays an important role in our country's ag economy, and there is real value in making sure that those rural communities have the tools that they need to grow and thrive. That's why I'm so pleased to be here today discussing how USDA rural development can aid us in that pursuit. 
Over the past couple of months, I've spent a lot of time traveling in my district. I've met with local officials, business owners, farmers and families, and many others. And one thing I can tell you is that rural America is facing many challenges right now, made all the more evident by COVID-19. The stark reality is that many rural communities are being left behind. The Agriculture Committee has talked frequently and forcefully about the importance of broadband connectivity shortfalls in our rural communities. But there are other challenges facing our constituents, including limited access to capital, worker shortages, aging infrastructure, and diminished access to health care services. If we can help meet those needs, it's all of our constituents who will reap the benefits. Not only do thriving rural communities benefit the ag economy, they benefit our entire country. Strong rural communities start with strong connectivity, but the needs of our rural communities do not end with broadband access. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to explore ways by which we can support rural America. Over the past year, my Republican colleagues and I have offered many proposals, including several bi with bipartisan support to bolster rural utility services, expand high-speed broadband programs, rebuild health, education, and public safety infrastructure, and more. We think that infrastructure can and should be a bipartisan success story. But we, sh we share Chairman Scott's deep concern and skepticism about plans to marry bipartisan infrastructure priorities to tax policies which will harm rural communities. USDA Rural Development plays an important role in growing rural communities and attracting new investment. Whether it's supporting economic development, assisting with loans and grants for economic development, health care and infrastructure, or assisting ag producers with their own operations, USDA Rural Development is well positioned to make a difference for citizens, the citizens each of us represent. I join Chairman Delgado in wel welcoming all of our witnesses. The health of rural America can be found in hard work, innovative thinking, and strong partnerships that each of you bring to your communities. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Fishbach, and, and do look forward uh, to working alongside of you. Uh, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements uh, for the record so witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for questions. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome such a distinguished panel of witnesses to our hearing today. Our witnesses bring to our hearing a wide range of experience and expertise, and I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for joining us. Uh, our first witness today is Dr. Finesh Kuneru. Dr. Kuneru is the founder, uh, president, and CEO of Excella Pharma Sciences in Lenore, North Carolina. Founded by Dr. Kuneru in 2005, Excella is a vertically integrated and fast-growing pharmaceutical manufacturer, marketer, and developer that today employs 380 individuals from the Caldwell County and Lenore area. Dr. Finesh, thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate and look forward to your testimony. Our next witness is Ms. Ines Polonius. Ms. Polonius is CEO of Communities Unlimited, a community development financial institution and rural development hub serving rural communities in the southern United States. Communities Unlimited works with local leaders to create fair access to resources needed to sustain healthy communities, businesses, and families. Communities Unlimited provides direct assistance and capital to communities, small businesses, microenterprises, as well as water and waste water systems. Ms. Polonius, thank you for joining us this morning. Our third witness today is Mr. Bob Fox. Mr. Fox has served on the board of county commissioners for Renville County since 2002. He also serves on the National Association of Counties Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee as vice chair and is a member of the National Counties Association Board of Directors. Thank you, Mr. Fox, for joining us. Our fourth, and no, not final, our fourth witness uh, is 
Mr. Todd Erling, Executive uh, Director from Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development Corporation and from my own congressional district. Uh, Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development Corporation is the only economic development agency in the Hudson Valley with a specific focus on the viability of the agricultural economy. Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development Corporation has also established the Farm and Food Funding Accelerator and the Incubator Without Walls to mentor over 260 businesses and 30 technical assistance service providers. Mr. Erling uh, is someone who also serves on my bipartisan locally based agriculture advisory committee and plays a critical vital role in our community helping rural and agricultural businesses access the tools they need to succeed. Mr. Erling, thank you. It is good to have you here. And last uh, but not least, um, to introduce our fifth uh, and final witness today, I'm pleased to yield to the gentlewoman from Minnesota, the distinguished ranking member of the subcommittee, Mrs. Fischbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ken Matson, the CEO of Lake Region Healthcare. Lake Region Healthcare is a rural not-for-profit provider that operates two hospitals, 11 clinics, an assisted living facility, and two surgery centers. Mr. Matson holds a JD from the University of Minnesota Duluth and has more than two decades in institutional knowledge and healthcare experience. He is testifying today on behalf of the Minnesota Hospital Association. Welcome, Mr. Matson, and thank you so much for being here today. I'd also like to give my personal welcome to Commissioner Bob Fox. Commissioner Fox and his wife live on a fourth generation farm in rural Renville County in my district, and it is my pleasure to welcome him to the committee today too. Thank you, I yield back. I thank the gentlewoman for her remarks. Um, and again, welcome uh, to all of our witnesses today. Uh, we will now proceed to hearing from your testimony. You will each have five minutes. The timer should be visible to you on your screen and we'll count down to zero at which point your time has expired. Uh, Dr. Kaneru, please begin. Unlimited, the southern partner of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. Communities Unlimited has been a certified community development financial institution since 2002 and functions as a rural development hub with 70 full-time staff serving seven states in the south from Texas to Tennessee. A footprint that comprises 45 percent of America's persistent poverty counties. 60 percent of people living in these persistent poverty places are people of color and represent an important focus of our work. Communities Unlimited takes a holistic approach by integrating and capital products, targeting water and wastewater systems and small businesses, local leadership teams, as well as small scale farmers. We are the Southern representative of the rural community Community Assistance Partnership, a national network of nonprofit organizations 
with 300 on the ground technical assistance providers helping to solve real problems to benefit more than 3.4 million people in rural and tribal communities in every state and territory each year. During 2020, RCAP leveraged more than $427 million in infrastructure funding, mostly USDA infrastructure loans. Opportunities for investment are many. In the U.S., there are 140,000 active public water systems serving communities less than 10,000 people. COVID-19 has exacerbated the challenges these systems face. A survey conducted by RCAP in May of 2020 indicated an estimated revenue loss of between 3.6 to $5.5 billion for small rural systems across the country. A year later, we know that most systems expended all of their reserves and many are no longer financially able to keep up with the needed maintenance um, nor loan payments. The Rural Equity Act, House Bill 498, seeks to provide debt relief to borrowers of several rural development loan programs, including the Intermediary Relending Program, IRP. CU currently has an active IRP portfolio of about a million dollars to rural water and wastewater utilities. Six months of debt relief would provide over $75,000 to help systems rebuild their reserves and address immediate maintenance needs. Currently, federal funding for USDA rural development programs makes up less than 8% of the agency's annual discretionary budget. Yet it is exactly these programs that are the lifeline right now to rural communities as they struggle to recover from the impacts of COVID-19. We need greater investment in rural water and waste disposal infrastructure through RD in the form of both loans and more importantly grants, as many systems can no longer afford to take on more debt. Existing water systems in financial difficulty need grant assistance, debt forgiveness, and loan restructuring included in the American Jobs Plan. There are many growth opportunities. Infrastructure is a driving factor for economic growth. As a nation, we are lucky to be a country of entrepreneurs. Rural America is no exception, where people start businesses every day to meet basic needs in their community, as well as turning great ideas into products. Today, we work with a young man in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, who launched an internet service provider to bring reliable broadband services to all communities in the Arkansas Delta. I know this committee has previously analyzed the need for robust and affordable broadband in rural places. I can't overemphasize the importance of broadband for economic growth. We need strategic investments in the Rural Business Development Grant and the Rural Micro Enterprise Assistance Program to support entrepreneurs in creating locally led ventures that will keep wealth local in the hands of rural people. Technical assistance is the connective tissue between USDA RD and rural beneficiaries and community. Capacity building is needed at three levels. One, leadership teams are an important success factor in community resilience, especially in places with a part-time mayor and little staff. They need support and skill building. Two, water and wastewater system boards of directors are elected volunteers requiring training on regulations, financial management, and board management. Many entrepreneurs need skill building in areas like financial management and digital marketing to be competitive. Solving the challenges facing rural communities today, especially in persistent poverty areas in the South, requires adequate funding, a strong USDA RD, along with capacity building to access that funding and then utilize it effectively. These are the building blocks of an economic recovery for rural America. I thank the committee for inviting me to testify today and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Polonius, for your testimony. Uh, now we're gonna try to see if we can connect with uh, Dr. Kineru, please uh, begin when you are ready. Uh, you, you might morning, still Chair be Delgado muted. And there you go. Ranking Member Fischbach, uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to be here of Excella. I have founded the Excella company back in 2005 and now um, we are uh, almost uh, you know, uh, 16 years in the, in the company. And 
since 2008, we have uh, been in Lenore, North Carolina, and we have been manufacturing pharmaceuticals since 2010. Excella um, uh, is a specialty pharmaceutical company that manufactures injectable pharmaceuticals. Uh, in the in the pharmaceutical manufacturing, injectables are uh, probably the one of the most complex uh, pharmaceutical products to manufacture. A lot of high technology and a lot of contamination controls. So it requires you know, high technology uh, investments and also equipment and training of the people. And we have today about close to 500,000 square feet of operating space under Excella. And we started with a small 20,000 square feet building back in 2008 in Lenore. And since then we have been building and a lot of that was possible, was made possible by the investments that we made uh, through private sources, personal funds, as well as a significant portion coming from USDA loans. Uh, USDA BNI loans have helped us tremendously at the right time uh, to actually take the next step and go further. And today we have almost 400 employees and with high paying jobs, um, our average salary today is roughly about $59,000, which is pretty high for any community, uh, except you know, on, the, on the coastal sides. Uh, but you know, we, are, we are willing to actually increase our salaries more to make sure that we get the right talent and also we incentivize people to join our company. And today we have you know, uh, uh, made a lot of advancements uh, in, the, in the company, and we are invested uh, close to $400 million uh, so far in the company. We have invested and reinvested every dollar we made in the company, and we borrowed a significant portion of it. Um, and with all that investment, we built a significant infrastructure uh, in the manufacturing. We have recognized the, uh, you know, manufacturing infrastructure as crucial uh, for the national, uh, uh, you know, the uh, strategic, uh, uh, you know, stra strategic purposes, as well as um, making sure that, you know, our patients are taken care of with the uh, needed medicines. Um, because of all of that investments today, we are in a position to actually help uh, the COVID vaccine fighting. We are about two weeks uh, away from manufacturing uh, commercial production uh, of COVID vaccine from our place, which is a significant achievement. Uh, we cannot name the uh, partner because we don't have the authority to name the partner publicly, uh, but we are very close to actually commercializing the product. Uh, all of that has been made possible by the investments uh, and the commitments we have made to the infrastructure buildup. We have, you know, even though these, the story is, uh, you know, is successful, but we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uphill battles that we have to fight. And there are two major uh, battles we are still fighting today. Uh, one of them is the funding. Uh, you know, we couldn't get uh, investments in significant amounts you know, from any banks, uh, you know, we, couldn't, we can't even get a bank loan today in a traditional sense um, because our company is growing, fast growing, and we don't have the traditional, you know, steady revenues that banks would like to see. So we relied on USDA support and also private lending. And of course, private lending costs a lot of money uh, and, you know, investments, you know, in millions of dollars we pay in interest. And that can be helped by raising the limits at the USDA loans uh, as a minimum today is 25 million. We would like to see that minimum to be raised to at least 50 million, if not 100 million. That would help really, you know, fast growing small companies like ours that require a lot of infrastructure investments. Uh, and the second, uh, you know, uh, struggle we have is with the manpower. Uh, today, it's very hard to find people in the in the rural communities, as you know, uh, some of you will know. Uh, it is, you know, we need to really incentivize people to come to rural areas or remain in the rural areas. You know, that that can start with the college students, where you know students go to college to other states, you know, other other towns, but they will be they should be incentivized to come back, and 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 build families and work in the rural areas. That is the only way we can solve this problem. And a strong rural economy is significant uh, for the, you know, for the country's growth. Uh, thank you very much. My time is up. Appreciate it. Thank you, 
Dr. Canero for your testimony. Very much appreciated. Next up, uh, Mr. Fox, please begin when you are ready. Chairman Delgadio, Ranking Member Fishbach, members of the committee, my name is Bob Fox and I serve as Commissioner for Renville County, Minnesota and Vice Chair of NACO's Ag and Rural Affairs Steering Committee. It's an honor to participate in today's hearing. For today's purposes, it's important to understand some of the historical challenges facing rural counties. Ongoing population losses are reducing the rural tax base, which has a direct effect on our ability to provide core services. Additionally, 43 states are imposing significant limitations on counties' ability to increase local taxes. The Great Recession also continues to plague rural counties. In 2016, nearly half of our nation's 3,069 counties were still struggling to recover as COVID-19 hit. Over 800 counties had yet to return to pre-recession general revenue levels, most of which had a popul population of less than 50,000. General revenues are the backbone of our county funding because they are not restricted to a particular activity. Most state and federal funding is becoming insufficient and too restrictive to help cover mandated county services. Roughly 93% of state and federal funding used by county is restricted to a specific function. Between 2007 and 13, 59% of the counties reported that these grants are covering a smaller percent of county expenses. Matching requirements place many federal resources just out of reach. Counties are increasingly forced to fund mandated services with general revenue dollars. For FY 2021, Renville County's budget centered around Main Street businesses and our agricultural community. We provided a budget increase of only 2% through a local levy. The flexibility of that local levy helped us meet the infrastructure needs not being met by state and federal programs. While we applaud the American Rescue Plan Act for including $61.5 billion in direct federal aid to the county government, it's important to remember the U.S. Treasury currently prevents local governments from using this lost revenue funds as a non-federal match. As rural counties look for ways to leverage our dollars, many of the USDA grant and loan programs mentioned today will remain out of reach. Counties are the front line in our nation's defense against COVID-19. Counties we own or operate more than 4,000 public hospitals, public health departments, or essential health and emergency centers. Renville County opened a new hospital in September of 2015, made possible by a 19 million USDA Rural Development Community Facilities direct loan and a 4.75 million loan guarantee. By March 2020, Renville County Public Health opened our Emergency Operations Center in partnership with Emergency Management and the County Hospital. Major priorities for our county included community mental health, continued daycare support, and reliable nutritional support for residents. That same year, our hospital partnered with a larger health system, which ultimately helped us provide drive-through COVID-19 testing. Counties are also fighting a war against crumbling infrastructure. Each year, counties invest more than 100 billion in our nation's roads, bridges, transits, and water systems. Prevention, mitigation, and vaccination expenses have far exceeded the declining revenue for the vast majority of counties, making matters worth long-term unemployment levels top of 4 million in January of 2021 thus increasing demand for local public services. Local governments are now forced to respond to these needs with 1 million fewer workers than a year before. Counties continue to deliver critical investments despite inadequate and restrictive federal resources. We desperately depend on a number of programs at the USDA Rural Development. Roughly 98% of rural Americans receive their drinking water from a small system and depend on USDA rural water and wastewater program. Meanwhile, USDA electric loan program help provide safe, reliable electric infrastructure to more than 90% of the nation's counties suffering from persistent poverty or out-migration. Broadband also proved to be a critical utility through the pandemic. Roughly 70%, 77% of small counties are experiencing the internet below the FCC's minimum standards, according to a 2020 NACO study. In 2011, Renville County, as part of a regional effort, began working with providers that help serve portions of McLeod, Nicollet, Renville, and Sibley counties. We also secured a grant only covering about 40% of the total project cost to extend middle mile fiber through Renville County. Using CARES funds, we did then able to extend service to our weakest areas and help residents forced to learn and work from home. At least 18 states imposed strict restrictions preventing local governments from making similar investments and partnerships in local broadband infrastructure. Many of these restrictions prevent local governments from providing affordable alternatives or creating a public-private partnership. 
USDA's reconnect program is critical for rural counties seeking to expand and improve connectivity. The steep 25% non-federal match requirement makes the resource difficult for many rural counties. Slow economic recovery and the Treasury's rulings on matching requirements will encumber our ability to bridge the rural digital divide. In closing, local government needs a strong federal partner that can provide reliable, direct, and flexible funding. If local governments cannot meet the steep fiscal or operational requirements to leverage USDA programs, our collective efforts to address rural America's challenges are done in vain. Thank you for the opportunity today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Appreciate your testimony. Okay, we back, we good? All right. Next up, uh, my friend and constituent, uh, Mr. Erling, please begin uh, when you are ready. Thank you, Congressman, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Fishback, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this hearing on examining opportunities for growth and investment in rural America. I also want to thank the staff that supports this committee and the staff that supports each and every one of you as members. They're invaluable teammates with us out here in the rural economy and, and rural communities. And I don't want to go without uh, the opportunity to recognize the role they've played supporting this organization and the communities that we uh, are responsible for. But most importantly, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to testify. As the chairman mentioned, I'm the executive director of a regional nonprofit that focuses on agriculture, local food systems, ag-related and ag-dependent businesses as economic development and with community development tools and programs. Sitting here today, listening to my fellow witnesses, you know, it's interesting to see the legacy and the hierarchy. We have counties represented, we have regions represented, we have individual entrepreneurs represented. And when I began in this position, I was actually a deputy director of an individual county economic development office. I was fortunate enough to have the background in community and affordable housing development prior to moving into that position. And since then have carried those perspectives and that holistic systems approach into looking at agriculture and rural development and identifying the needs and creating solutions with partners, not only from the county level, county economic development offices, industrial development agencies, uh, but also state and federal. And you hear the alphabet soups that we all work in. I really appreciate the CDFI opportunity. Another opportunity I wanna talk about is not only SBA, but EDA, Economic Development Administration, but we really need all the arrows in the quiver, all the tools in the toolbox to address not only our rural, but also our urban challenges, because many of them are overlapping and many of them have similar common denominators. However, some of them don't have tools to address the challenges. When we look at rural economic development, when we look at rural community development, we're really talking about rural urban relationships and the flow between capital and the flow between people, goods and services from our urban areas into our rural areas and vice versa. That's actually been recognized through several of the witnesses testimony we've had so far. At Hudson Valley Agribusiness, I've been lucky enough to be part of a founding group of peer organizations that represent upstate New York and New England in the Agricultural Viability Alliance. And some of the common denominators and challenges that this subcommittee, as well as USDA Rural Development can help us with are one-on-one -on -one business technical assistance, helping our rural entrepreneurs have the same tools that urban and suburban entrepreneurs have through small business development centers, through some of the other best practices that we've seen with strategic planning, access to accounting, access to human resources, and the ability then to take and implement not only the 
um, expertise, but marrying that to capital sources and capital programs like CDFIs, like EDA Rural Development Programs, like USDA BNI programs. And so I really just want to highlight the fact that the CARES Act, the Rebuild America efforts through the ARPA, our annual budgets, as well as our farm bills, have a hole. We really do not have a square peg for a square hole or a round peg for a round hole for BTA, business technical assistance. And many of us make it work through LFPP and other programs. But if we could establish some standalone business technical assistance programs that not only support best practices and developing a Rolodex of service providers and agencies, but also have year over year funding opportunities that we can count on similar to block grant funding for urban areas. And with that, I would just want to wrap up by talking about the Rebuild Rural America Act that has been introduced. This would be a real opportunity for our rural communities to have similar tools and strategies of year-over-year -year funding to implement strategy that was created by the rural communities, knowing that there is multi-year opportunities and flexibility, not only for the hard infrastructure, but the soft infrastructure. Business technical assistance at the core is about humans, their expertise and the relationships that happen year over year to implement the strategies and to tackle the challenges that happen in an entrepreneur or business or community's lifespan. So with that, I just wanna say, I'm open for any and all questioning. I really can't wait to connect with some of our other witnesses offline. And thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Erling for your uh, your testimony. Uh, next, we have Mr. Madsen. Uh, please begin when you are ready. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, Ranking Member Fishbach, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for providing the opportunity to speak on this important topic today. Um, I am the CEO of Lake Region Healthcare. We are a uh, not for profit private healthcare organization uh, located in West Central Minnesota. I'm testifying today on behalf of uh, the Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, I'm not a clinical individual. Um, I'm an attorney by training, uh, but I've been in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. I am though the son of a nurse uh, who worked for decades uh, at our organization as a nurse leader and have a deep passion and commitment to rural Minnesota and rural healthcare. I'm blessed to lead an organization that's been one of the many healthcare organizations that has been continuing on the front line of this pandemic taking the lead in responding to COVID-19 for over 17 months now. Uh, we partnered though through that with public agencies, both for services and funding, uh, and we're uh, proud and pleased uh, to continue in this effort for the foreseeable future. Um, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit health organization. We're made of about two hospitals. One is a larger community-based not-for-profit hospital located in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. And the second is a critical access hospital located in Elbow Lake, Minnesota. Uh, we have 11 clinic locations in communities across West Central Minnesota, as well as an assisted living facility and two surgery centers, one in Fergus Falls and another in Morris, Minnesota. Together, our enterprise has about 1,100 staff members and about 110 primary physicians and providers. I believe that hospitals are one of the basic physical and organizational facilities needed for communities to thrive. No matter the size, location, or demographics, hospitals and health systems are the cornerstones of communities in our country, including and in particular in rural Minnesota. And this is especially true that we've seen over the last 17 months. Not only do hospitals and health systems provide um, accessible and high quality care in our remote areas, uh, through the pandemic, uh, we've responded to a healthcare crisis that nobody in our generation has seen. Um, in addition, we are major employers in our regions that provide reliable, good paying jobs. And we also serve low population areas that have a disproportionately aging population with increased medical needs and limited mobility. We have growth uh, in our core county uh, over the upcoming uh, years, but that growth is primarily an aging population, which is gonna put additional demands on our systems. Over the past year, rural hospitals answered the call to service during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been on the front lines, not only taking care of patients that have come to our facilities, but also to try to control the spread of the virus through testing, 
contract tracing and vaccine deployment. Um, in addition, we've been a trusted resource for public health information for our neighbors and in our communities. Now we know that rural hospitals and health systems face enormous challenges. This includes declining reimbursements, increased costs, difficulties recruiting and retaining our healthcare workforce and limited access to capital. In fact, the Minnesota Hospital Association reported that 31 of the Minnesota hospitals, which is about 41% of all Minnesota hospitals, had negative operating margins, and all but two of those were in rural areas. Um, over the years uh, and today, rural hospitals continue to face the need to update and replace outdated facilities. Uh, these large expenses can be a huge burden given our lack of access to capital. Uh, we have limited size, we have a limited population base, and we have razor thin margins. So oftentimes we're unable to access capital through traditional methods. So this makes investments from Congress that create loan and grant opportunities for rural healthcare systems critically important to our future. At a critical access hospital in Elbow Lake, we were a thankful beneficiary of a USDA Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program. In 2013, we finished construction of the Prairie Ridge Healthcare Facility in Elbow Lake. It's a 53,000 square foot state-of-the-art hospital, which replaced an aging 1960s facility uh, that had long ago outlived its useful life. The upgrade was a complete game changer for us. It enhanced patient safety and accessibility, expanded services such as general surgery, orthopedics and obstetrics, and an upgraded technology to better serve our patients in those local communities. Before our facility was constructed, we had about 11 uh, providers. Since then, we've been able to recruit and retain 37 new providers. In addition, we uh, staff about 120 nursing operations, facilities and administration staff and Prairie Ridge provides outreach to other communities uh, adjacent to us. Um, we're not a large facility, but we do take care of a large population base. So we're thankful for that program. And I'm again, happy to answer any additional questions that may come up from members of the subcommittee today. Thank you, Mr. Madsen. And, and let me just say thank you to all of the witnesses for your very informative uh, and insightful uh, testimony. At this time, uh, members will be recognized uh, for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. You will be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. Please keep your microphones muted until you are recognized in order to minimize background noise. I now uh, will recognize myself uh, for five minutes and I do want to begin um, with Mr. Erling, your, your testimony mentions uh, issues facing rural communities, uh, lack of capital access, underfunded schools, failing infrastructure and access to high-speed broadband. You also mentioned uh, the Rebuild Rural America Act as a way to provide sustained strategic investment in our rural communities. I introduced the Rebuild Rural America Act with several of my colleagues on this subcommittee after hearing from constituents, local elected officials, and community leaders that our rural communities need, as you put it, direct and flexible resources to best fit their needs. The bill would provide five-year block grants to strengthen rural communities. Often we hear rural communities lack the time or resources to work through the different federal application processes. The Rebuild Rural America Act would also help rural regions navigate the application process by providing training and technical assistance. Mr. Erling, can you expand on how this sort of model could help get rural communities above water and moving forward? Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. You know, I mentioned uh, my background of working across affordable housing, holistic community development, and then really specializing in agricultural economic development. And several of the challenges that have been universal, whether I was working on affordable housing, whether I was working on traditional economic development, has been year-over-year -year funding and consistency and flexible access to critical funds or critical mass funds that could then be also leveraged with additional state, 
additional municipal or local, and even philanthropic dollars. And the Rebuild Rural America Act at its base really provides some of that foundation and addresses the competitive disadvantage that many of our rural regions and many of our rural communities have compared to urban areas that have the year-over-year -year block grant funding available and consistently can plan to implement and have the flexibility for both the human soft infrastructure side as well as the hard uh, traditional infrastructure side. So I think some of the things that are critical that we want to make sure that we can actually address is not just having access to the funding to implement, but also having access to the funding to plan and create the tools with the human side. And so I just want to address a little bit with the business technical assistance. Business technical assistance relies on experts, accountants, attorneys, strategists, PR specialists, and in the food and rural development world, uh, food safety specialists, engineers, et cetera having a solid Rolodex and having opportunities for those experts to make a living providing services to rural entrepreneurs and rural communities is critical. And the planning that you get with year-over-year -year funding and the stability opportunity that you have with something like a community development block grant lays that foundation so you can build the Rolodex if I go back to a previous era, or build the bench of service providers. And it's not unlike what we need to do to address successional planning for farming. You know, the average age of the farmer in New York State is in the high 60s and is creeping up. And successional planning and successional members, whether they're farm members or whether they're actually never ever farmers that want to move into the arena, require the human resources to support them. So that's one of the things I really just want to drive home about the Rebuild Rural America Act. It's not just the year over year funding, it's the fact that it's regional. It's the fact that it can be planned for and implemented by a strategy that is brought upon by the regional communities. And then you can actually start to benchmark and build momentum and critical mass and human resources because you have that stability and because you have that block grant year over year access. Thanks for the opportunity and I'm happy to build off of this at any time. Well, thank you. I, I, um, I see I'm bumping up against five minutes. Uh, you, you, were, you basically addressed my second question, was, was the importance of business technical assistance uh, for agricultural uh, businesses. I actually sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack urging use of existing pandemic funding to support one-on-one -on -one business technical assistance for small and mid-sized farm and food businesses. And you've done a good job of explaining why that is so important. So thank you. Uh, for your answers there. I now would like to recognize the ranking member Fishbach for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Madsen, uh, and thank you again for testifying. I, I enjoyed my uh, visit to the facility in Fergus Falls, and uh, so thank you for that. But um, just wondering, um, you know, did you seek other sources of funding for the Prairie Ridge facility? and? And why did you decide to move forward in particular with the community facilities program? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, uh, the uh, community facilities loan program put together a total package of about $20 million. $60 million was a direct loan and $4 million was a guaranteed loan. Um, we did look at other funding sources, uh, but quite frankly, uh, without the USDA program, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, the longer repayment term, a fixed interest rate at a lower rate created affordable access to capital that wasn't otherwise available in the market through kind of traditional programs, whether it's bond or a commercial bank. Um, the long-term um, uh, amortization period allowed us uh, a, a more favorable cash flow. Um, and uh, the other uh, component of it, um, our borrowing profile at that facility and our credit worthiness might not have been up to spec um, with some of the commercial lenders at that time. So um, the uh, USDA program um, and the eligibility requirements, which we met and surpassed, uh, created um, you know, affordability and, and not only affordability, but, but also access. We were a qualified buyer or borrower uh, for USDA, but maybe on the, on the cusp of a commercial bank. 
Um, we we're also able to fund a higher level of project costs than traditional markets required. So we did more of a facility um, than we could have built if we had to come up with a, a higher um, upfront payment. Um, the financial covenants requirements uh, were less restrictive with the USDA. Uh, they're appropriate. Um, they monitor our progress um, and, our, and our status. Uh, but some of the commercial lending requirements are a little bit onerous for a smaller facility like ours. Um, and while there is more paperwork with the USDA program, uh, the requirements of the loan are actually less onerous and less restrictive. The upfront costs are less. Uh, the low, close, loan closing process is more efficient. Um, and the monitoring and compliance requirements during the loan term are, are, are less onerous. So we did look at other bond financing opportunities, other commercial bank financing um, opportunities, but the USDA program by far uh, checked all the boxes of this community uh, facilities that was ultimately developed. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, and uh, Commissioner Fox, I will just ask you, I, I appreciate you again for being at the committee today, but um, in, you, you mentioned uh, broadband, and in your experience with broadband, um, are there any lessons you learned between the state grant experience and, uh, the, and applying for ReConnect? Uh, I guess the lessons uh, I've learned is I wish I could do a retake of about 25 years ago and let the REA take this over and do it rather than hodgepodge pieces together. And I think that's the hardest piece, especially uh, in our county, we have five different telephone companies and systems. So uh, it was kind of cumbersome at times, but uh, people uh, are really into the piece where we got wireless to them, especially last year when their kids were at home and uh, we got probably 80, 85% covered, but uh, no, it's just the process, and the process that you have to go through to, to get to the end result. And, and just a quick follow-up, um, you know, are there any, any suggestions you would make um, based on your experience with the program, any suggestions you might make an improvement? And, and I have about a minute left, so there might not be a time to explain them all, uh, but, but if there's something that you have that would be helpful for us to know. I think the biggest thing for us as counties was talking to our neighbors. If we, if we didn't talk to our neighbors, we could have never got a provider to come in and help us what we wanted to do. And that was the biggest piece, talking to our neighbors and, and so that you can get connected uh, and get, get the service in that you needed. You are never going to do this alone in a rural county. You need partners and you need your neighbors. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will yield back my 20 seconds. <laughs> thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, I now uh, recognize the gentlewoman uh, from Iowa, Ms. Axney, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Delgado, for holding this hearing and to our witnesses for being here today and sharing your experiences. This has been a great conversation uh, so far, so much to talk about. But of course, the success of rural America is so vital to this country. And Mr. Erling, I, I so appreciate you bringing that up. Every ball bearing for every Ford Explorer is made in my district. So folks in Detroit benefit. But the topic of this hearing, of course, is around rural America. And I first want to talk about uh, something that's so important to rural America in the middle parts of our country, biofuels for our rural communities. Unfortunately, the last administration repeatedly undermined the renewable fuel standard through small refinery exemptions, removing over 4 billion gallons of ethanol demand from the market. And conservative estimates uh, put that cost of over two years of those exemptions at over $5.3 billion in economic loss. So what happened here is it greatly reduced opportunity in rural Iowa and, of course, rural communities across the country. And while I've been pleased with this current administration um, has previously said that they believe and value the importance of RFS, it's important to reiterate that any action that reduces big oil's obligation to decarbonize their fuel through biofuels would be a continuation of the Trump's failed policy. So that can't happen. And as we look to invest in our rural communities and decarbonize our transportation sector, we must uphold the RFS. Now, Mr. Fox, uh, you note in your testimony that rural communities were still struggling to recover from the 2008 economic crisis when COVID-19 hit. I know you don't have direct experience uh, with biofuels facilities, but 
Can you talk about how critical agricultural facilities or similar plants are for rural communities and the devastating impact closures of such plants would have on our communities? Chairman Delgado, Congresswoman, uh, I do have a lot of experience. I've been involved in the state corn growers as a past president of the state and the National Corn Board. And so I saw the ethanol industry grow in Minnesota through the cooperative model. And uh, it uh, has done tremendous growth throughout our state because of those dollars getting back to the farm. And, and when I was farming full time and, and trying to make a living and, ra and raise children with a dollar and 75 cent corn and no ethanol plants, it didn't work. And, and when we got the ethanol plants and got another 50 or 75 cents a bushel to that crop, and that money goes down Main Street, and we spend it seven times down that Main Street, it has created wealth in the state of Minnesota and across the Midwest. It has, it's been a, it's a, been a great uh, thing that the biofuel industry has done. Well, I appreciate you reinforcing how important this is to our rural communities, and thank you so much for that. Now I want to turn to the USDA's Rural Development Program, which of course is so important to our community. And I've introduced bipartisan legislation, the Rural Equal Aid Act, uh, which provides for nine months of loan relief to four USDA RD loan programs like RMAP and IRP. So reviewing the testimony today that I'm hearing, many of you have experience with these loan programs. So with the time remaining, I'd love to open this up uh, to hear about what your thoughts are for rural communities if USDA provided such relief for the borrowers of these programs. And Ms. Polonius, I'd like to start with you and thank you for mentioning uh, my Rural Equal Aid Act. Um, given your experience with IRP, what are your thoughts on implementing something like this and the benefits it could have? Congresswoman Axney, thank you for the, the legislation and thank you for your question. We have direct experience with this through the SBA uh, debt relief program that was part of the CARES Act. Uh, it provided for six months and then it came back and provided an additional, I think, three months. Um, this was a lifesaver, uh, relatively easy to implement because SBA literally sent us those payments and then we credited those borrowers for those uh, months of payments. It was a lifeline and what we attribute to the fact that our portfolio is relatively intact. I think we need exactly the same on the IRP side, on the RMAP side, uh, because there are a lot of micro entrepreneurs that had a very difficult time accessing programs like the PPP. Um, and they, they now stand in line, you know, waiting for some kind of debt relief um, in, in the process. So, um, and the same thing goes for, for our portfolio on the IRP side, which is water and wastewater loans. Uh, I'm very happy to hear about the nine months uh, versus the six months, which, which I was made aware of, um, which would be even greater help. What, what these water systems need right now is to be able to save money to put back into a reserve because they don't know when the next crisis is going to hit. And while USDA infrastructure lending is so critical, it, it has a longer lead time. And so we strongly encourage every system to have a strong reserve for those for those small emergencies that, you know, turn out to have huge impact. Um, so I'll end there seeing that I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. My time's expired and I yield back. Thank you. I now uh, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our panelists for being here today. Uh, let me follow up on some of the previous uh, uh, thoughts that were being made here. Uh, I think uh, with Mr. Matson, um, we were, uh, you know, I have a very rural district too, like a lot of us on this committee, and uh, uh, we want to talk about um, the importance of telehealth, you know, the ability to do a lot more things uh, at a distance electronically. Would you would you touch base on how there in Minnesota for you how how uh, how key that is for you or, or your others that you have worked with your experience on that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the for the question. Um, uh, telehealth was one of the first tools that we pulled out uh, when the pandemic hit, um, recognizing that we uh, started to shut our facilities down from the outside to make sure that our workforce and our patients were protected. Um, we rapidly uh, spun up uh, increased telehealth. Um, we saw probably an 80% uptake in what we had uh, been previously uh, experiencing. So um, it was definitely an accelerator 
Um, and since then, um, we have continued to step that up. Uh, so we've refined our processes, we've created better patient flows, we've uh, created better care flows. Um, and one of the things that we're also able to do now is we're able to use that technology to bring consultations from larger metropolitan areas to our patients. So it's not just primary care, but it's also specialty care. And a lot of the uh, uh, techniques to deal with uh, uh, care that comes into our emergency departments like uh, trauma evaluations, stroke care, those things can be done on a consultative basis from a distance. So we're able to take care of people closer to home and more at home uh, than previously before. So definitely the crisis was an accelerator event. Um, and I believe that uh, telehealth will uh, continue to stay. Uh, we do need some time uh, to put system process and structure um, and some funding for that. Uh, so we have asked for uh, some parity and reimbursement. So we're treated and paid the same way as an inpatient visit um, or an in-person visit. But once we get those systems and structures in place, we should be able to deliver them at a lower co cost profile, but that will take some time to do. Yeah, so um, but that makes perfect sense. It's what we're experiencing up in my home area too. And, and so it always comes back when we talk a lot on this committee and we've, we've got some, made some good ground on broadband. And so when we're looking at different funding sources and different, uh, well, more emphasis on broadband, would you t please uh, uh, expand upon uh, that thought for me? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we can make services available on our end, but if we don't have connectivity to all of our patients, um, uh, it's either a no experience because we can't get to them or it's a very poor experience. Um, when you're conveying healthcare information, uh, details and specifics are very important. So um, an interrupted, uh, a slow uh, or downtime events uh, really impair our ability to take care of our patients. So uh, strong band, broadband, a strong network, a strong built of that infrastructure is really important, no different than the bricks and mortars uh, that uh, we built out through the community facilities program. Um, and again, we are going to need this more and more. Um, and building that out is something a little bit different than we've done before. So uh, we're facing a little bit of, of, of new uh, challenges, but that's new opportunities. But we do partner with our uh, teleservices around our community. Uh, we have quite a few of them, but it is a long distance to string the line, so to speak. But it's very important to deliver our essential service. Yeah, you, you, you made a really good point about the um, ability to have uh, more specialized uh, services that maybe a small rural hospital can't possibly employ, the type of personnel or maybe even equipment that they can't cost effectively do. So with uh, telehealth via good broadband, uh, it makes a lot more things possible at that local level. So uh, um, why don't you, um, when we're talking about specialists and, and the uh, challenges of getting them and getting them into, uh, uh, again, a more rural scene, why don't you, uh, why don't you finish out uh, my 40 seconds with that, please? Yeah, um, as I pointed out in my testimony, as a direct result of the facility build out, which created better places to take care, plus um, uh, facilities that were built out that weren't available in the 1960s, building like a brand new state of the art surgical center, we're able to recruit 37 specialists uh, to our small communities. Um, and, uh, and that would have been very difficult uh, to do with our aging facility. In this day and age, um, there is a provider shortage on primary care, definitely on specialty care. Um, and some of the economic opportunity that the metropolitan areas offer, we just can't offer in, in rural communities. So um, we need facilities that attract and retain talent. Uh, thank you, I yield back, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. Thank you. I now uh, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. An excellent hearing, and I want to again welcome all the witnesses. Mr. Erling, in your testimony, you discuss how farmers too often lack training in business planning and financial literacy, which can, which can make it even harder for them to access government assistance uh, during uh, difficult times. I recently toured the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences, uh, which is in my district, and which rigorously prepares its students to succeed 
in a variety of agricultural fields. Do you believe that more agricultural high schools uh, like uh, the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences, as well as community or junior colleges that have a focus on agriculture could be beneficial in equipping future farmers with these skills and other types of skills. Thank you for that insightful question, Congressman, and I applaud you and your district for having the opportunity to implement uh, an innovative opportunity with the public school system, and it sounds like with also the community and the private entrepreneurial market and producers. I think a uh, broad spectrum approach that does include our public schools is absolutely critical. I think in our rural regions, as well as our urban centers, uh, we are seeing some insight and we are seeing some uh, significant synapses closing so that we have these new opportunities or are restarting these opportunities. Future Farmers of America in my area is, is one of the um, programs being embraced by public schools. But I also wanna reinforce that our public school system often relies on a solid tax base. And so the public school system is really a component to make sure that we are feeding the entrepreneur system, the producers and the markets so that we continue to produce revenue and capital. And it's really that opportunity to be at the forefront to make sure that our youth as well as our existing entrepreneurs and our senior and aging business members are all working together one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you for asking that great question. I look forward to working with you on that in our own district. Uh, last uh, April, I published an op-ed in the Chicago Sunshine entitled, When White America Catches a Cold, Black America Catches Pneumonia. Pneumonia. In the op-ed, I wrote, it is always the most vulnerable who fare the worst by far, particularly when it comes to the black community. Hurricane Katrina devastated a region, but it effectively obliterated the black middle class there. The Great Depression uh, damaged the entire economy, but by all accounts was particularly disastrous for black Americans and further widening the already vast racial wealth gap. And although America is, is rightly fixated by the mass shootings that happen in our schools, churches, and constant venues across the country, there have been 36 mass shootings in my district alone, which is a, ma a ma majority minority district since the year of 2013. Uh, it is clear, in my opinion, that rural America is in the same boat and is too often left behind by our recovery efforts. Ms. Fox and Ms. Uh, Polonius, do you have any suggestions for ways rural America rural can uh, partner with urban America uh, to address these same shared concerns? So in my 10 seconds, I will address the fact that part of our technical assistance program moving forward focuses not just on the health of the business, but also the opportunities for wealth creation of those business owners, in particular, uh, black business owners, which make up about 85% of our technical assistance portfolio and about 80% of our lending portfolio. Uh, so you speak to a, a really important issue, Congressman Rush, that is really dear to our hearts <laughs> at Communities Only limited and something that we focus on very much in the South. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I now uh, recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, great 
testimony from all of you. Uh, I, I represent Western New York State, uh, which is uh, heavily rural, and uh, so a lot of what you have talked about today uh, encapsulates many of the challenges in the 27th Congressional District. Um, I, I wanted to just ask a question for Dr. Koningbrew, uh, who is the, uh, as we talk about certainly the need for more business creation, more entrepreneurs, Dr. you are the um, sole person who is one of those. And I was just curious as a, um, a pharmaceutical uh, company, um, a biotech company, uh, why did you decide to locate your business and launch your business in a rural community? And uh, I was also, uh, just a follow up on that, what, what advantages do you see you have by making that choice? Because uh, maybe we could kind of replicate <laughs> what you're doing uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, thank you very much uh, for asking that question. I, I've been asked this question several times. Um, the reason why I went to Lenore is because uh, it was the best choice at the time I had, uh, considering we had limited funds and uh, our needs were small at the time. Uh, so we could just get by with a small building and uh, you know, limited funds. Uh, that's that's what we did. But there were other factors as well. For example, the the location has a very strong infrastructure in the uh, because of the uh, furniture industry that was there. So it had a very strong uh, electrical grid uh, that was there already. And then the local community uh, was uh, you know, based on manufacturing. So they already had manufacturing experience, even though they were not really a GMP FDA manufacturing uh, you know, base. But we, we thought that we could train them uh, and it would take some time, six months or longer, but that was an investment we were willing to make. And there are other factors for Lenore, for example, the facility, I mean, the place was, uh, is, you know, a very nice area. You know, I lived in a lot of, you know, heavy uh, traffic, uh, you know, uh, cities, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, New York, San Francisco, DC, et cetera. So I know what traffic is. And this was very refreshing for me uh, to see zero traffic, you know, two minutes to work, all of that stuff. And, you know, very clean air, uh, you know, very attractive to me. Okay. And then, uh, you know, the other areas, the other aspect of this is the low cost of living uh, compared to, you know, East Coast and West Coast. Uh, so these are all really many advantages that it can be replicated, that they can be replicated in many rural communities. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you uh, to, uh, you know, kind of uh, encourage your uh, entrepreneurs to start businesses like me, uh, like mine there. Great, thank you very much, Doctor. I'll just conclude by, I, I think that uh, as, uh, as a post-COVID, uh, 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 and I'm, I'm glad we can talk about it, calling it post-COVID now, I think there's a great opportunity uh, for rural America. Uh, I, I've seen in our, my area of Western New York uh, that we're, we've seen a lot of people come back home, uh, expats from, let's say, New York City uh, during uh, this, this COVID time and actually had a newfound appreciation for the quality of life, uh, the, uh, uh, the ease of um, uh, moving around. And I think the big issue here is the, uh, the opportunity to try to keep these people here. They realize that they can work remotely, they can keep their job in the big city and travel there periodically, but they don't have to sacrifice quality of life for them or their family. I think that's a great opportunity for us to seize, uh, and I think uh, rural broadband is key to that. And I'm, I'm so glad that we're talking about that at, at every level, at every discussion right now in this committee and elsewhere. And I hope that's matched by our budgets and our funding this is just critical uh, for the future of, of our, our regions here collectively. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now uh, recognize the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my colleague. I commend your remarks, and we have bipartisan common ground when it comes to rural broadband and to people moving from the city into our communities. So I agreed we need to capitalize on that opportunity. I'm glad we're having this important discussion on sustaining and strengthening our rural communities and economies. In order for our nation to thrive, especially as we recover from the devastation of this pandemic, we need to make sure that no part of the country is left behind. In times of economic turmoil, rural America is often hardest hit. Congress hasn't always done a good job of addressing this, but I'm pleased with the progress we've made over the last decade, especially here on the Agriculture Committee. In the last two farm bills, I've been proud to allocate funding and expand the reach of the Northern Borders Regional Commission, an economic and community development federal state partnership that serves rural counties in the Upper Northeast. MBRC awards millions of dollars to worthy projects in New Hampshire each year that help to generate jobs and career opportunities, as well as to bolster the infrastructure and the economy in our rural communities. More broadly, USDA rural development loans and grants have been a critical lifeline for towns and nonprofits across my district. From affordable housing to community colleges to clean energy projects, USDA rural development is a key part of making innovative ideas a reality in rural America. Moving forward, there's much that Washington can do to further support our rural communities, and that includes expanding broadband access. The most recent USDA agricultural census found that 13% of New Hampshire farms did not even have internet access. And even looking beyond how this impacts farmers and food producers, we know that broadband connectivity is critical for everyone. So I'd like to ask uh, the witnesses, if I could, um, what would you recommend that we do with broadband access? And how do you think we can make a difference in providing internet access to every household? Chairman Degato, Congressman Custer, uh, I'll take a stab at this, Commissioner uh, Fox will. Uh, I think the, the one thing uh, we should do different in different parts of the country, but we're in a flat agricultural land. So we were able to connect our middle mile with Wi-Fi towers and get that out and have services up to 50 up and 50 down. And that was enough to get the education piece going when kids were at home. So I think it's technology and, and, and it's always changing technology because the word I hear now from providers is that if we move the towers closer, we can even increase those speeds. And as time goes on, that's gonna be the most important piece. Uh, the dream would be to have a, a fiber to every home and, and every farm. And, but right now, some, some places, it's just not uh, economical to do that. Um, Mr. Erling, I'm impressed by your efforts to build out agricultural entrepreneurship in the Hudson Valley. Could you speak to the most predominant challenges farmers face with business development and financial planning? And do you see ways for the USDA to enhance their capacity for providing business and technical assistance to synchronize the efforts? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, or Congresswoman, I really want to also commend you and the efforts that you have done, you know, with the Agricultural Viability Alliance that we are a part of, you and your team has added to the support opportunities with the letter Congressman Delgado led on, and also with diversifying the different alphabet soups. I really appreciate Northern Border Regional Commission recognition, but also recognizing that it's only um, islands in the stream at this at this point, and we need some more flexibility for those federal funds to really make the difference. So the biggest opportunity that I see is making sure that the technical assistance service providers, the BTA, have consistency, training, and professional qualifications similar to what we see with other disciplines and other opportunities. And I think that in rural regions like yours, as well as with some of our partners like Land for Good, which your office is an amazing partner with, we can really develop some of those tools in concert with your support and your staff. 
Great. Well, my time is up. I did want to ask about the aging population, uh, particularly in our Northeast region. Um, I'm a big fan of the Beginner Farmer and Rancher Program and the Arm to Farm Program for Military Veterans. So I'll work with you and with our committee to encourage uh, new energy and new vitality on our farms as well. Thank you very much. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I now will recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feenstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Delgado and Ranking Member uh, Fishbach. Uh, my question for uh, Mr. Erlang, in your testimony, you mentioned that 40% of American farmland is likely to change hands in the next 20 years. You know in your work in providing succession planning to aid in the transfer of, of agricultural land, as you've helped farmers with their transition planning, would you describe each family farm's transition as being unique to each one? And depending on the per particular farm structure or the number uh, of children and family members involved in the operation, uh, Mr. Yearling, would you say that this would be uh, unique uh, for each uh, transition planning uh, issue? Yeah, I appreciate the question, Congressman. And I do have uh, to say, I agree with you that um, there are unique circumstances to each transition and to each family and um, individual farms um, opportunities as well as challenges. But I think there's also some common denominators. We actually have a, a program that's partially funded by philanthropic as well as state called the Hudson Valley Farm Link Program here. And American Farmland Trust is really critical at helping us launch that. So we do have some common denominator components to that, but then we also do have some opportunities where it is a challenge um, and unique by funding, by interfamily relationships, and sometimes even by pivoting to new commodities and new market opportunities. But the bottom line is, you know, we need to facilitate those unique circumstances to fill the gap with our aging populations and our market demands that we have in our in our uh, suburban and urban areas to support our rural communities. Yeah, I, I, I firmly agree with you. Th thanks for noting that, that each family farm tra transition is probably unique uh, unto their situation. There's some commonality, but it, it is very unique. Uh, this is why I, I have grave concern about the Biden administration's proposed tax policies. I have heard from many Iowa farm families concerned about proposed policies regarding the treatment of capital gains and stepped up in basis. The administration claims they will provide agriculture exemptions for inherited uh, agriculture land, but I don't know if it is possible to provide a workable exemption for all farmers, given the complexity and diversity of how farm operations are structured. In fact, a study from the Agricultural and Food Policy Center released this morning confirms that eliminating stepped up in basis probably will impact 98% of the farm transactions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that this study be submitted for record. Submitted. Thank you so much. As discussions around tax policy, as discussions around tax policy continue, I think it's extremely important that we consider how these proposals would work in real life, in real situations. We need to be looking towards solutions that help family farmers to transition operations and create additional investments in our rural communities, not creating huge tax liabilities for our farmers and small businesses. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Feenstra, uh, I now uh, recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Chairman Delgado, and thank you, Ranking Member Fishback, for holding this very important um, hearing today. And I want to thank also those who are testifying. Um, I'd like to uh, look back to the 2018 Farm Bill for a moment, if I may, um, and uh, talk about some language that um, I was able to secure in the Farm Bill. Um, through our office to create a rural health liaison position at the USDA. Then uh, last year, we filled the position through the appropriations process. The goal of the rural health liaison is three things. Number one, improve coordination in rural health care delivery. Number two, promote awareness on the USDA resources available to help finance the construction of hospitals and telehealth infrastructure. Number three, 
coordinate with other government agencies or rural health on rural health issues. Uh, my questions are for Mr. Fox and Mr. Matson. And Mr. Fox, if you could answer first, and then uh, Mr. Matson, if you have anything to add on to this, um, if you could chime in. Given what I just shared with you about the office's duties, how do you feel the rural health liaison can be most valuable, most valuable in the COVID recovery? Um, second part of that same question are there specific areas in the rural health care space that could be helped by better federal government coordination? Mr. Fox, if you could go first, please. Uh, Chairman Degado and Congresswoman, I think anything that can be done to help rural hospitals uh, with the technical piece and being able to move forward with telemed is very important. The more we can partner and more learn from each other, the better off we are. It's just so important. And I appreciate the work you've done. Mr. Madsen? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think one thing that uh, um, was illustrated through uh, COVID crisis, um, John Maxwell uh, recently quoted, a crisis doesn't make you, it reveals you. Um, and one of the things that was revealed um, was the need for coordination of all of the resources that we had um, from funding to patient care. Um, we are so uh, geographically disconnected in some respects that the level of coordination uh, in, in rural uh, spaces was, was, was uh, much higher demand and, and more dragging on our systems than in urban uh, metro concentrated areas. Uh, definitely, uh, we are thinking now about how we're going to recover uh, from uh, the pandemic. Uh, the uh, OIG uh, inspector report released on March 23rd um, that hospitals reporting the COVID-19 public health crisis has significantly strained the health care delivery system. I would commend um, the subcommittee to review that report because it really does uh, actually capture the pulse of health care organizations. And definitely one of the things that we're concerned about is our ability to recover um, post-COVID, our financial instability um, from higher costs and lower revenues. We're not sure where our volumes are going to recover. So coordination of funding resources, coordination of the infrastructure build out and definitely coordination of, of building out uh, telehealth, um, not just the infrastructure to deliver the product, but also uh, the electronic medical record. Um, over the next five years, our organization is going to spend about $28.5 million on EPIC, which is our electronic medical record, which helps us take better care of patients. It's a better data resource, um, but we are required um, under all of the uh, uh, regulations to have uh, the connectivity, um, but it is expensive. So getting that product and having funding available for that is equally as important as having funding uh, available to build the buildings and the facilities. So if you think about $28 million over five years, that's a significant uh, uh, spread, um, and it's an ambulatory surgery center, uh, bricks and mortar equivalent. Uh, but the interoperability requirements, which again are a great policy to have, um, that has to be coordinated again. So it's not just the access, but it's the product that we use to deliver the care that's important to consider uh, equally as much as, as the broadband solution. But I think that coordinator position uh, would tie a lot of loops that, that uh, um, might remain open right now. It'd be nice to close those. Well, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now recognize the gentlewoman from the U.S. Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our guests who are here. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, this is really, as has been said by so many of my colleagues, a really important hearing to examine opportunities for growth and investment in rural America. Our rural communities face a number of serious challenges today as we continue to recover from the coronavirus pandemic. I can't think of a more important topic for this subcommittee's first hearing of the 117th Congress. And I look forward to working with the members of this subcommittee to address these issues today and over the course of this next Congress. <laughs> Ms. Polinius, 
You raised some important points in your testimony about the role that USDA rural development plays in providing critical services in communities across the country, including in response to natural disasters like drought or hurricanes. My home of the Virgin Islands is a prime example of what you mentioned in your testimony. Our home was ravaged by two devastating hurricanes in 2017, while drought currently persists across the Virgin Islands. USDA Rural Development has played a key role in helping us respond to these challenges, and the agency conducts extensive lending activities in the Virgin Islands. But I still believe that there are ways that we can improve and expand the reach of USDA Rural Development programs. So my question is, of the infrastructure investment priorities that you outlined in your testimony, do you believe that these investments could help rural communities improve resiliency and better respond to natural disasters going forward? Thank you, Congresswoman Plaskett, for the question. Um, through the Technical Assistance Program, which is funded by USDA by the name of Technotrain, we actually assist communities in building resiliency plans. Um, and this addresses both um, cybersecurity vulnerability all the way to natural disasters. Um, what, what we have been inquiring about, Congresswoman Plaskett, is a dedicated pool of funds that would allow us to respond immediately um, at the time of a disaster and be able to lend into um, some of these projects. So during that same year um, that, that your home was destroyed, uh, we were working on the other end of the country in Texas after Hurricane Harvey. Um, within five days, we had mapped out every single water and wastewater system that is a USDA borrower to understand the level of need of those systems. With our relatively small uh, CDFI and loan fund, currently we're at about 20 million in assets. Back then we're at about 12 million. We made a $900,000 loan. We made a $650,000 loan, which was really an exception to our policy because we wanted to move quickly to help those communities rebuild those key infrastructure systems um, before people left the community. Uh, and I think what we learned from Hurricane Harvey is once people leave um, a community because they don't even have basic services like water and wastewater, they can't clean their home, they can't rebuild their home, um, they don't come back. Um, and that community is then pretty devastated because all the businesses that were relying on the population are now have, you know, half the demand uh, for their businesses and, and the, you know, uh, process sort of keeps going. Uh, so, so that is where I think um, as a country, but also as a USDA RD and the technical assistance providers that are supported through RD um, need to be prepared to, to react and move quickly um, and, and, and have the flexibility and funding to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fox, uh, you mentioned in your testimony how various matching requirements for certain federal programs often create hurdles for local governments. Can you speak to how these requirements may disproportionately impact rural areas, especially in areas that are working to recover from national disaster or areas that have economic recession? Thank you, Chairman uh, Delgado and Congresswoman. Uh, the matches are very difficult for rural counties, uh, especially now with this money that's supposed to help replace some of our funds. And now we are told we are not gonna be able to use that as a match. So how do we do that? Uh, you know, for some counties that can't raise any more funds because of state laws, uh, that will cause problems in rural counties. So uh, anything that we can do to reduce that or maybe the U.S. Treasury look at uh, changing their, their guidance, uh, that whatever tool we can put in that toolbox to use to help these rural counties. Thank you. My time has expired and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now uh, would like to recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Kamek. There we go. I wanted to make sure I was uh, off mute. Uh, well, good afternoon now, and thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member Fishbach, and to all of the witnesses for being here today virtually. For too long, our rural communities have been left behind playing catch up 
In the 21st century economy, as we all know, many of us represent rural districts. Now, beyond this subcommittee hearing, there is a larger discussion afoot on the future of infrastructure, rebuilding America, and doing it better. However, that conversation has become hopelessly distorted as words like rural development and infrastructure have now a catch-all for the administration and the majority's policy agenda. Many of the witnesses here today have already echoed my view that rural development is about building back critical infrastructure, blanketing rural America in reliable, fast, affordable broadband, and supporting our domestic producers. I am encouraged to hear about what many of you have done to harness the resources through USDA toward accomplishing these goals. So I'm gonna jump into some questions. Um, Ms. Polonius, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of community-based strategies and building regional partnerships. And this is the model of economic development that I also support. And in the last Farm Bill, the committee provided the authority for the secretary to set aside funds for communities that work collaboratively across multiple stakeholders and government entities. Now, can you just very quickly elaborate on how these stakeholder groups can work a bit more efficiently as we move forward in talking about rural development? Congresswoman Kemick, thank you for the question. Uh, for us, and, and again, my vantage point is specifically in persistent poverty of rural places, uh, because we have so many of them here in the South. It's a two-step process. Uh, first, we build leadership teams in communities because we can't just rely on a part-time mayor with little or no staff, right? It needs to be carried by a diverse leadership team that reflects the community. And then as we build the capacity of that leadership team, we look together with them at strategic opportunities on how to link up to micropolitan areas, how to share resources um, with local, other local rural communities, um, and, and really begin to develop strategy, whether that is a regionalization of a water or wastewater system, where that makes sense, um, or whether that is an economic opportunity uh, to really figure out how do we create suppliers for corporations that may be located in that micro or metropolitan um, uh, entity and then figure out how do we create that regional connection between the two. I hope that begins to answer your question. It, it does, and as a follow-up, Having worked uh, pretty extensively throughout the years on the issues of rural development, a lot of times with our stakeholders, there tends to be a lot of finger pointing with accountability or lack thereof. When we have multiple stakeholders from different government entities and community organizations who come together, how can we better hold the group accountable and get into a more productive conversation rather than a lot of the finger pointing? Maybe you could point to some best practices. I think one of the, the challenge, challenges, Congresswoman, is that, that funding goes through one lead entity. Um, and then there are subgrants and subcontracts that go out to the other stakeholders. And that instantly creates sort of a hierarchy um, and puts that lead entity in a position to be accountable uh, to, the, to the federal agency when, in fact, it's the subcontractors that may or may not be able to, to perform at that point in time. So, you know, if, if there could be a funding mechanism that actually looks at the collaboration as a whole, um, that would be a very powerful model uh, for us to work on, where everyone is equally accountable and not just the lead agency. Uh, because, quite frankly, it's difficult to find that lead agency for this very reason, uh, whether that's in a community or whether that's a nonprofit um, or a county agency. Excellent. Now, thank you so much for your, your commentary. The time I have left, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, Mr. Erling, in your testimony, you had discussed the challenges of transferring agricultural land, both through succession and new farmers. Now, what are the challenges, in your opinion, I, I have my own opinion, but I would love to know your opinion on what some of those challenges are and um, how you specifically can help farmers successfully plan for what is outside uh, uh, of control for the clients. Sure, thanks. And in the short time I have, I appreciate you recognizing that. Often it's um, flexible funding and making sure that you get fair value for the exiting farmer or for the previous generation's um, investment and equity. Okay. 
a really short answer and I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. And with that, I yield back. I think uh, my time has expired. Thank you. I think that concludes uh, all questions um, from the members. Uh, before we adjourn today, I invite the ranking member uh, to share any closing comments you may have. Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, putting together the hearing, and I appreciate the opportunity to just say a couple of words. You know, thank you to everybody for participating today in the hearing. Uh, you know, I appreciate the perspectives of um, all of the witnesses that joined us and all of the valuable information you've been able to provide. And I, I will just say, Mr. Chair, I, lo I look forward to continuing the dialogue and working with you to, to really come up with some great solutions for rural America. So thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Fishbach. Uh, as we close uh, out this hearing, I, I would again like to thank uh, our panel of witnesses for their time uh, and expertise. I have no doubt that you are all assets to the rural communities you work in and with to support long-term sustainable growth and development. The lessons and successes you shared with this subcommittee are invaluable as we work to build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic. One thing was made abundantly clear today. Meaningful investment in rural America and rural infrastructure is critical to our nation's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and necessary for rural communities to reach their full potential. We have an opportunity right now to make significant direct investments in rural America that will improve the lives of generations of people, support our goals as a nation to build back better and help ensure that our rural communities aren't left behind. For the sake of every farmer, rancher, forester, student, teacher, or business owner living in a rural area, I hope this Congress recognizes the importance of a strong rural economy and are willing to make the critical investments that we heard the need for today. And with that, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Commodity Exchanges, Energy, and Credit is adjourned.